All right, so let's tie up some loose ends involving pressure and hydrostatics. So, so loose ends and example problems involving pressure and hydrostatics. So uh, first we're just gonna recap our results from last time. Sometimes deriv lengthy derivations, we can sort of lose track of what the key takeaway is. So I just want to recap that. Then I'm going to talk about a, some terminology that you might run across when you're doing pressure or hydrostatic problems um, that you know can be a little confusing at first, but we'll just clarify here. Uh, and that's gauge pressure versus absolute pressure. and also specific gravity. Then we're going to do three example problems. The first example problem uh, is basically going to be if I have a watch, and it's a waterproof watch. Sometimes you'll see waterproof watches only have a rating to, to certain pressures. And that's basically because those the watches have sort of lots of internal seals. And if the hydrostatic pressure gets too much, those seals can break and then let a bunch of water in, ruining the electronics. So we'll do an example problem for uh, a watch pressure rating. Second, uh, second example problem we're going to do is with hydraulic cylinders. And it turns out that hydraulic cylinders can basically accomplish things pretty similar to levers. Uh, hydraulic cylinders can basically act as force multipliers. So in a way that, you know, if you have a lever, and you push on one push on one side of the lever, you can get a much higher force on a different side of the lever that's closer to the pivot point. Well, hydraulic cylinders can actually sort of accomplish a, same, a similar thing using pressures and areas and diameters to to get your get your force multiplication effect. And then the third thing that we're uh, the third example problem that we're going to talk about. Um, is we're going to imagine a disaster, a disaster in the Lennon household where the wall of my bathtub breaks. And we need to figure out how much force I need to apply to hold it up and to keep the, the, the deluge of water from flooding my bathroom. So we're, go we're, we're gonna do all of this today. So let's get started with a recap of the results from last time. So imagine I have a cup of water and I imagine a chunk of fluid in that cup of water. Well, this chunk of fluid has uh, has forces acting on it, and in a sense, um, this this chunk of fluid sort of needs to support the weight of all of the water above it, right? If I if you know if I if I sort of took away the sides of the jar, you know, if I and you could imagine even if this if this weren't some liquid but instead some solid, and I had some block, some solid block right here and I had a bunch of blocks stacked on top of it, then this block would need to support the weight of all of the blocks on top of it. Right? And we could sort of imagine that as exemplified here, you know, if I have some block and I have a bunch of blocks on top of it, all of the blocks on top of it are pushing down on the top face of this block right here. So uh, how does that relate to pressure? Um, well, it turns out we have a uh, you know, a pressure at the top of this that's, that's you know, all of the weight of the stuff on top of it, and a, difference, uh, a different pressure on the bottom of the block, because the pressure on the bottom of the block not only needs to support all of the blocks above the block, but it needs to support the block itself. And we ended up, you know, doing some sort of force balances and analysis, and the key result here is that we were able to relate pressures to essentially the weight of the, of the fluid itself, 
and the key result that we got, we got sort of two results, one that was a differential equation, and then one that was a result if we integrated that differential equation. So the differential equation is basically dp dz is equal to minus rho g. And in this case, z is essentially our coordinate, our, our vertical height. We assumed g is pointing downwards, and g is the gravitational acceleration. We said that rho is the mass density of the fluid. So what does this mean? Um, well, dp dz uh, is, was a somewhat new term, and this is what we call the pressure gradient. And it's essentially a derivative of pressure with respect to z. And basically, what does that mean? So it basically says, hey, you know, if we go up in z, if z moves up, then pressure decreases because the right-hand side is negative, right? So if we wanted to plot, you know, pressure, pressure versus z, where z, where, you know, z equals zero starts down here, and let's say the top of the fluid is right here, we would anticipate that the pressure at the orange point is less than the pressure at the green point because the green point's at the bottom of the vessel and needs to support all the weight above it. And that's sort of consistent with this minus sign right here. So pressure goes down as we go up in z, right? And that's basically, and dp dz is essentially the slope of this curve here. So that's, that's essentially the essence of, of this uh, pressure weight of fluid relationship in its differential equation form. When we integrated, if we integrated and made two key assumptions that density is constant, i.e. not changing fluids, right, we don't have like an oil, uh, a layer of oil on top of a layer of water or something goofy like that, and also we assumed g was constant, which is pretty good unless you're sort of dealing with planetary scales, um, then, then we got this result here that we could relate sort of any two points. You know, we could sort of pick two points anywhere in the fluid and relate the pressures and z positions of those. And this basically relates, relates a change in height, a change in z position to changing pressures. One final thing that we wanted to go for, uh, that we wanted to relate to, um, is to essentially relate pressures and forces, a key result from last time. So pressure is equal to force Time, uh, force divided by area. So if we wanted to go, um, you know, if we wanted to relate um, forces, pressures, and areas, we could, if we wanted to get a force that was due to a pressure, we could multiply that pressure times an area to get the force. Or if we wanted to say, hey, some force is distributed so over some area, what is the equivalent pressure that that applies? You know, we could calculate things, right? So this is the sort of trifecta that relates force, pressure, and area. And the key thing here is, you know, this has a similar relation, uh, a similar format to shear stress, but in this case, the forces associated with pressure are normal to uh, to the surface that that pressure is applied to. So thus concludes the recap of our results from last time. Now let's talk about gauge pressure versus absolute pressure. So. Let's imagine, again for a moment, I have a beaker of fluid, and, uh, and I just asked you, you know, what is the pressure, what is the pressure here at this, uh, at this point at the top of the beaker? Um, you might you might you know come up with uh, a couple answers depending on whether you're talking about gauge pressure 
or absolute pressure. So if we're thinking about pressure, um, the, the, key, the key difference between gauge pressure and absolute pressure is relative to what? So if, we're, if you're talking about absolute pressure, For if you're uh, and and this relative to what is basically you know what are we setting our zero point? What what are we using as our zero point for pressure? So if you're talking about absolute pressure, the zero what what zero pressure is uh, uh, is in absolute pressure is a complete vacuum. Is, is a zero. And in contrast, if we're talking about gauge pressure, atmospheric pressure, is, is zero. So if we're talking about what, this, what the pressure is at this point, the gauge pressure at the point at the top of the beaker is going to be equal to zero pascals, and the absolute pressure is would be equal to uh, one atmosphere, which is equal to uh, let me look it up, which is equal to one hundred and one kilopascals, or 101,000-ish pascals, give or take a little bit. There's some rounding going on there, but um, but that's that, right? Um, so if we go back to this relationship here, this relationship works the same whether you're do, whether you're using absolute pressures or gauge pressures. You know, in in a sense, if you're using absolute pressures or gauge pressures, this is just a pressure difference, right? So pressure differences don't matter if you're using gauge pressures or absolute pressures, so long as you express both of them in gauge pressures or both of them in absolute pressures. All right, so most, most fluid mechanics works so most fluid mechanics works as long as you're consistent across all of your uses of pressure. So why why do we use two things? Well, you can you know like why do we have this system where some you know uh, where we have you know both absolute pressure and gauge pressure you know relevant? Well, a lot of times it's just convenient to work with gauge pressure because it's a lot easier to carry a bunch of zeros through your calculations than to carry along this 101 kilopascals all over the place. So, um, so in fluid mechanics, a lot of times we end up working in gauge pressure because it's nice just to set a zero at some you know relevant part of your system that's exposed to atmosphere um, and then just kind of work relative to that point you know, rather than sort of carry along this one atmosphere. The only exception is if you're doing things like ideal gas laws, you know, PV equals NRT if you want to dust off the high school chemistry. In that case, you got to deal with absolute pressures. So um, in the context of this class, I recommend we mostly deal with gauge pressures because we're not really going to be doing ideal gases too much. Um, and a lot of times it's more convenient to sort of set a zero point at some surface of fluid even though, strictly speaking, um, there is pressure there. It's atmospheric pressure. But, you know, since most times we're just dealing with pressure differences and essentially the atmospheric pressure would cancel out in the subtraction, usually gauge pressure will be the most convenient. All right, so thus concludes our discussion of gauge pressure versus absolute pressure. Now let's talk about specific gravity. So specific gravity has a pretty straightforward definition. Um, well, it actually has two definitions. And it's just basically an alternative way to describe something that is related to, de uh, to fluid density.
uh, it's an alternative way to describe an alternative way to describe fluid density. It turns out that it has two definitions. One, if you're dealing with liquids, and another if you're dealing with gases. And remember, in the context of fluid mechanics, you know, a lot of times people think fluid liquid, but gases are fluids just as just in the same way that liquids are, right? So but uh, so in most contexts in fluid mechanics, it doesn't really matter if you're talking about a liquid or gas, except for specific gravity, which has separate definitions for liquids and gases. So the specific gravity for a liquid is by is defined as the density of whatever fluid I'm talking about divided by the density of of water at at room temp. And for gases, the specific gravity of a gas is defined as the density of the gas you're interested in divided by the density of air at, at room temperature. So, um, and just, you know, just so you can have these values in your notes, um, the, the density of water at room temperature is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter and the density of air at room temperature is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter and I'm not gonna ever ask you to like memorize too many things in this class but we'll be using water and air so frequently in this class that you know, probably by the end of it, you might have these memorized anyway. But, you know, if you're going to memorize two densities, these are probably the two most relevant ones in fluid mechanics. So, this is specific gravity. And if you, uh, you know, so people don't really use specific gravity too much in engineering calculations, but a lot of times if you want to look up the properties of fluids, uh, textbooks or online resources might give you specific gravities but of course if you know these two densities that's all the information you need to calculate what the actual useful quantity is density for these quantities so there we have it check discussion of specific uh, of specific gravity so now let's move on to three example problems so let's do an example problem that involves the pressure rating of the seals for my watch. So when I was eight years old, I got a, a watch and I thought it was so cool because it was waterproof. Well, it turns out it was waterproof-ish and it, on the side in very fine print, said that it was rated to two to two atmospheres gauge. And of course, you know, I was eight years old, I had no idea what any of this meant, but it sounded technical, and that gave me something to brag about on the playground. And it also set the stage for a cool example problem when I became a professor some number of years later. That's now. So let's say my watch is rated to two atmospheres gauge um, before it loses its the, the waterproof effect of its seal. So my question is, how deep can we go with it? So let's say I wanted to, you know, take my watch um, on vacation with me to the Bahamas and go scuba diving. How deep can I go with this watch that's rated to two atmospheres gauge pressure? So, take a moment now, pause and ponder, and then, you know, uh, we'll work it out. So, how deep can we go? And deep, we'll assume I'm diving in, in water. All right, so hopefully you've paused and pondered. Um, we can, if we're, if we're thinking about diving, um, you know, and going in depths of water, we can dust off this relationship here. And we're going to assume, uh, you know, I think it would be pretty safe to assume that 
water is um, that density of the water is constant, you know, um, and we're not changing what type of fluid we're diving through, right? So, um, so there we have it. So we're going to assume constant density and constant g. So that means we can go straight to this result. Let's sort of sketch our system here. I'll call point one the surface, and I'll call point two the the safe max depth that I can die to dive to. We're going to treat rho and g as known constants. And we're going to treat p1 as a known constant. And I think, you know, since the rating was given in terms of gauge pressures, and a lot of times it's convenient in these problems to deal with gauge pressures, p, the p1 will, will set equal to zero um, so we can work work in terms of gauge pressures. P2 is the pressure down here, uh, sort of beyond which um, we would exceed the pressure rating of the watch. And this is going to be equal to two atmospheres, which would be two times 101 kilopascals or 202 kilopascals. So let's plug some of this stuff into, into the equation, right? So we can say P2 minus P1 is going to be equal to minus rho g. We should, we should define our coordinate system. And let's just put z right at the surface here and pointing upwards. So in this case, z2 is going to be equal to, if we, if we say, you know, the distance between these two is h, then the position of z2 is going to be minus h, right? If I set my z equals zero right here, then I can basically say z2 is minus h, and z1 is going to be zero. So it's p2 minus p1 times rho g z2 minus z1. Hey, wait a second. My only unknown here is this safe depth um, that I could dive to. So I can solve, uh, solve for h and kind of plug everything in. So let's do that. So this would be 202 times 10 to the third Newton per square meter. These negatives cancel out, and I can divide both sides by rho g. So density of water is going to be 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and g would be 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, and, that's, and this is going to be equal to h. And you know we have everything in base SI units here. And if you do out the calculation, you end up getting something like 20.7 meters. And just for a sanity check, let's, let's also check that the units cancel out. For Newtons, we would have kilogram meter per second squared per meter squared in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have kilogram per meter cubed times meter per second squared. The one over second squared cancel. Um, the kilograms cancel. And then we would have meters over meter squared. So we'd have one over meters in the numerator. We'd have meters over meter cubed in the denominator. So we have one over meter squared in the denominator. So one over meters divided by one over meters squared would be equal to meters, which is consistent with the units we have here. So baby you know who is now very happy because the units line up. So there we have it. Thus concludes a use of this equation here. First example problem, check. Now let's talk a little bit about hydraulic cylinders. So hydraulic cylinders 
are often used. You might see them in, for example, like cranes or excavators, right? You might see some metal things slide or into or out of another one. They're oftentimes used in rob robotic prostheses, right? So you can see, you know, like hand grippers or things like that. Um, the Instead of having biological muscles, they have narrow hydraulic cylinders. Uh, you might have seen um, like Big Dog or Pet Man or other robots use hydraulic cylinders. Um, and also, uh, YouTube channel from, I don't know, it was popular half a decade ago, the Hydraulic Press channel, um, you could get immense forces from hydraulic cylinders. So hydraulic cylinders are useful as force multipliers. So, and, and in a sense, they're kind of, you know, they accomplish a similar purpose uh, to levers. So let's sketch out what, what a hydraulic cylinder system might look like. So oftentimes there's some there's some fixed housing. And then there are two cylinders inside this kind of gap, inside this chamber inside, and the cylinders can move. Uh, and so what might, what might those cylinders look like? Um, let's say we had one cylinder on this side, and let's say they're circular cylinders. Right, so let's say we had one cylinder on this side, and it had some rod sticking out that we could apply forces to if we wanted to. And then let's say there was another, uh, another cylinder on the other side. With a rod sticking out. And, you know, there, uh, and in order to make sure the system wasn't accelerating, you know, uh, we would sort of need to have equal and opposite, um, well, we need to have forces applied to them, but they're not necessarily equal and opposite because the, the, the housing chamber can also support some forces too, right? So we apply some force here, and we actually get a different force here. And the relationship between the two forces um, is as follows. So we apply some force, uh, apply force, We apply some force to one cylinder, and that essentially pressurizes the fluid in between. So if we apply some force here, then the applied force here results in the fluid inside the chamber essentially becoming pressurized. And then that pressurized fluid pushes on the other cylinder requiring some force at the output to kind of hold this cylinder back. Or in a sense, you know, this cylinder can then push on its environment to, to do something, right? So the pressurized fluid then um, essentially push, pushes against its environment and its environment pushes back on it due to Newton's third law, right? So the pressurized fluid then pushes And depending on the areas of these two cylinders, you can get you can get um, radical differences, right? So let's let's sort of frame you know you know what type of output we could potentially get, right? So let's say I apply some some force to this first cylinder. I don't know. Let's just say ten newtons. Um, and let's say I knew the area of this first cylinder was, let's say, one, one square centimeter. I haven't perfectly drawn it to scale, but let's say we also knew the area of this second cylinder was 10 square centimeters. So my question to you is what, what force does the environment apply back on this cylinder if our system remains uh, hydrostatic? So what is this if we remain 
right? If our environment can apply enough force back to this other cylinder for our, our system to remain hydrostatic. And you can treat this as a uh, treat this as a pause and ponder before we work it out together. Okay, so let's work it out. Let's follow this chain of reasoning that we had here, right? So um, if you imagined I looked at this first cylinder in isolation, right? And I assumed that there was negligible friction between the walls and the cylinder itself. So if I just looked at my first cylinder and drew a free body diagram here, I could say, OK, I'm applying F1 to this side of the cylinder. But there's some as of yet unknown pressure acting on this face. So the force, sorry, the force on one on the inside due to pressure um, must be equal must be equal and opposite to this and if we dust off the notes from earlier we know that this force due to pressure is equal to whatever pressure is in the interior of this fluid system and you know strictly speaking we know pressure varies with depth but I'm just I'm just going to neglect that for now. You know, sorry for the uh, for a little bit of sloppiness there, but you know, for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to neglect variations in pressure with depth um, for this problem. So we could say, all right, we're just going to say that all of the stuff inside here is roughly at the same pressure times area area one. So we apply F one. We know that there needs to be some pressure force on the inside. And if we sort of considered this cylinder here, positive pressure is sort of defined acting inward on whatever volume or whatever object we're analyzing. So whatever pressure we have is kind of acting this. So in this case, the force one for pressure must be equal to our applied force, F1. If our, if our sum of forces in the x direction is going to be equal to 0. So this actually gives us all of the information we need to find whatever pressure all of the fluid has. And it turns out that whatever pressure is, is being applied to this cylinder must also be the same pressure that's everywhere. Right? So as long as, we're, as long as we're sort of neglecting the variations in pressure with depth, you know, we're sort of assuming that the centers of these cylinders are kind of on the same level. Whatever pressure's here has got to be whatever pressure's there because pressure is sort of acting, you know, all there. And, and essentially the center lines of both of these are at the same depth. So uh, if, this, if the interior of here is hydrostatic and the, the center lines of these things are at the same depth, then whatever pressure we had here is also the pressure acting there. So if we did a little free body diagram of cylinder number two, then F2 is pushing cylinder this way. And pressure times A2 is pushing on the cylinder this way. And these two forces must perfectly balance out. So what does this mean? Uh, our pressure that we can determine from cylinder 1 times the area of the second cylinder is going to be equal to our as of yet unknown F2. And would you look at that? We now have here a system of two equations with two unknowns. That's your favorite thing if you're a high school algebra student. And it's our favorite thing because, well, you know, we still have that same love of mathematics. Um, and if you solve for F2 in terms of, you know, canceling out pressure and just in terms of our known constants, you get F2 is equal to A2 over A1 times F1. 
which if you plug in the actual values, the 10 centimeters divided by 1 centimeter squared, we get a factor of 10 out here. So we end up with 100 newtons at the output. So hydraulic cylinders can act as these force multipliers and the, the sort of the scaling factor from an input force to an output force is the area ratio of the two cylinders. So if you want to have a large increase in force, then you want your output cylinder to be the big one and your input cylinder to be the small one. Because you basically only need to push against a small amount of that pressure with your input cylinder, but you get all of that pressure pushing on the big cylinder as your output. But um, as we'll talk about in a future lecture, there's no free lunch um, because you, you'll need to apply, you'll need to push that first cylinder for a much larger distance to displace an equivalent volume to, do, to moving that second cylinder for a small amount. So in the same way with levers, there's no free lunch. Um, you know, you need, to, you need to push the long end of the lever a larger distance with a smaller force in order to get a larger force over a smaller distance on the other side. It's the same thing with hydraulic cylinders. So that's our key result. So thus concludes our second example problem, a discussion of hydraulic cylinders acting as force multipliers. Now for a third example problem, let's describe a disaster in the Lannan household where the wall of our bathtub breaks and we need to talk about what force we need to hold back the wall of the bathroom and also or the wall of the bathtub and also where to apply where to apply that force to hold back the wall. All right, so here's my bathtub. I'm just going to say it's a rectangular bathtub. And the toddler, the toddler was playing a little bit too rough and pushed really hard against the wall of the tub. And also, I was a little bit of a sloppy parent, and I filled up the tub all the way to the top with water. So the to the, filled up the tub all the way to the top, the toddler was pushing on the wall, and all of these seams for the entire wall of the tub, we're just going to pretend that they all broke at once. It was a poorly constructed tub. So, so here's the tub, and um, we know some information about this tub. Um, for example, we know that it's full of water. And of course, we know what the density of water is. Uh, we know that um, gravity is pointing downwards like this. Let's say we know the height of the tub. And we also know the width of the tub. Um, and, you know, we, we could know the length, the, the, this dimension, but that's actually going to be irrelevant. Um, what we don't know is how much force I need to apply. How much force I need to apply to the wall of this tub in order to keep all that water from just pushing, pushing that wall of the tub outwards, right? So... The, the tub is full to the brim, full to the brim of water, and all of that water is going to want to push that wall and tip it over outwards. Um, and then the other thing that I don't know is what is the height uh, between the ground and the point that I apply that I would need to apply this force. So uh, in order to, in addition to keep the wall from accelerating outwards, also keep the wall from tipping over the top or sliding out the bottom. For example, if I put if I put my a force all the way at the top, then it's going to open up sort of like a um, like a bread box. Um, if I put if I push the force all the way at the bottom, then the top would tip over and it would open up sort of like a toaster oven. Um, so I need to put I need to apply the force in just the right location, just the right distance. Let's call it L up from the bottom in order to in order to not have this 
this wall rotate when I'm applying the force. So we're going to basically treat things that I've drawn in blue here as known constants and these two things as unknown constants in order to do this, in order to sort of deal with this. Um, so there we have it. Um, so, so this is the information and we need to and we need to basically figure out these two things with these known parameters here. We're going to need to make a couple of assumptions in uh, our development of the solution of this problem. We're going to assume that water is incompressible, i.e. that like its own pressure above it doesn't like condense it and you know change its density. So it's incompressible, i.e. constant density. And we're going to assume that although the, the, the toddler was very unruly and pushed the wall of the tub away, uh, after, after the seams broke, everyone stopped and was, stood very stationary and that um, the, the entire system is hydrostatic. So no one's, no one's moving around you know, after the initial breakage of the seams of that wall. All right, so. Um, the key pieces of inf information that we're going to use to solve this problem is we're going to, you know, if, if everything is indeed hydrostatic, we're basically going to say, hey, this wall, this, that, you know, that's coming off, if I'm applying just the right force at just the right distance up from the bottom of the wall, um, it should not accelerate. And, uh, and it's, it should not have angular acceleration or, or rotation as well, right? So no angular, no angular acceleration either. And uh, the implications of these two things are that the sum of forces is going to be equal to zero, as well as the sum of moments going to be equal uh, equal to zero. So that's going to the these principles are, and are going to get us some equations and we're hopefully going to have at least two equations with which we can solve these two unknowns. So that's that's the game plan. So um, so when we think about forces and moments and all this stuff, well we should probably start with uh, drawing a free body diagram and I'm going to do a free body diagram uh, looking at the side view of this wall. So before I get too deep into doing that, I'm going to define my coordinate system. I'm going to make x this sort of direction here. I'm going to make z this direction that points up. And it's, it's going to, you know, z is going to start sort of at the base of, of this tub right here. So z is going to be pointing up. x is going to be pointing out like this. And y is going to be pointing in, in this direction here. So let's do a side view of this wall. And that's going to help us balance, uh, help us develop our force, our force and moment balance. And we're basically going to consider um, forces in the x directions and moments about the y axis. So let's look at that side view. So here's the side view of the wall right here, the seam that just broke this vertical seam we can see right here. And if we're thinking about a free body diagram right here, there are going to be a couple of forces um, on this wall. And uh, right now I'm just going to consider the forces in the x direct, the forces that would act in some sort of the x direction since, that, since that's ultimately what we're looking for for our force applied here. So we have our force applied. Our force applied right here and we also have a force due to all of the pressure the hydrostatic pressure that this water is sort of pushing against the wall remember pressure is sort of defined inward so if, if we have our wall right here the pressure from this water is acting inward on the wall but the tr the the tricky thing about this problem is that pressure is not constant um, across this whole wall. You know, a lot of times if we want to relate pressures and forces, we just multiply by area. Pressure times area equals force. But 
that's not going to work so hot if we have a non-uniform pressure distribution over this wall. So pressure on the wall is not constant. And for this problem, we're we're going to um, we're going to consider that. So what do I mean here? Well, um, let's work in gauge pressure. And if I think about it, right at right at this point, at the very top, right here. Pressure should be equal to zero, right? Um, and if, if we're working in gauge, in gauge pressures right here. So pressure right at the top is zero, and pressure at the bottom is going to be rho, you know, rho g h uh, right at the bottom here, right? So we're going to end up with this pressure distribution on the wall where we have virtually no pressure pushing at the top because we're, you know, basically right at the atmosphere right here. And as we go towards the bottom, pressure increases and increases and increases until we get uh, rho g h at the bottom here, right? So here we have this gauge pressure distribution on the wall that's non-uniform. And that's, that, you know, that's going to be a little problematic for us, right? That's, that's going to be tricky, right? So, um, so how do we deal with this? Well, we're going to need to apply enough force in this direction to counteract mm -hmm. the net force from this distribution of pressure acting in this direction. And let's just give ourselves a couple coordinates. We'll say z starts at the at the base and points upwards and we'll we'll say x goes in this direction. So, how can we work out? We need to work out what this net pressure force, right? So, what is Uh, from this pressure distribution. Yikes, this is going to be a little tricky. And in some ways, if we have a variable pressure distribution across a whole surface, we're going to need to implement a, uh, not exactly the same, but a pretty similar problem solving strategy to what we did when we solved the problem of the spinning disk viscometer, right? So um, anytime you have a, a non uniform distribution, of something and you want to get its cumulative effect, whether it's a non-uniform distribution of shear stress or a non-uniform distribution of pressure, you're going to need to integrate to get the overall um, force from a shear stress distribution or a pressure distribution. So let's proceed with uh, the analysis that we need to do to set up that integral. All right, so. What, what is this going to look like? I'm going to go back to a 3D view, and we're, we're going to use sort of both a 3D view and a 2D view to kind of deal with this right here. So, so imagine I have my wall right here, and I have this pressure distribution right here. Well, when we were solving the shear stress problem, we needed to slice up this into a bunch of, a bunch of little areas such that within each little area, something was constant, and then we could integrate to add up all of the, the little bits of force, right? So when we had our uh, viscometer problem, we added up a little shear stress times little areas to get some overall effect. Here, we're going to add up little bits of pressure acting on little strips of this wall to get some overall force. So what is that gonna look like? I'm gonna take this, wa this vertical wall, right? This, uh, this wall right here, or this wall right here, and I'm going to slice it up into a whole bunch of slices. So that's, so that's what I'm going to do. And each slice is going to have the full width w of the wall, but each, slight, each slice is only going to have an infinitesimally small height, what I'll call d, dz. Now, why did, I, why did I slice my wall up this way? Well, the pressure across any position along one of these slices, for each slice, pressure is constant over the whole width of the slice, but each of these slices is gonna be at a different depth. So each of these slices is gonna have a different pressure. So I defined it this way such that for each slice, pressure's the same, 
um, throughout that slice, but all of the slices are going to have different pressures. So when I add up all of the little bits of force from all of the little pressures times all of these little areas, I'm going to get the overall pressure force from this whole distribution. So this isn't the first, nor is it the last time we're going to need to do some kind of slicing strategy in this class. So so our slicing strategy when our distribution is non non-uniform put d something for in our case dz um, so make your d dimension the tiny dimension the infinitesimal dimension in the direction of variation so for example in this problem in this problem pressure varies with z so we need to slice up this wall with dz's as our as our dimensions. And we can choose um, other dimensions. Such that whatever whatever our non uniform distribution, you know, we'll choose our other dimensions such that um, such that the even though this thing is a non uniform distribution within within each slice it is uniform so for example we don't have any pressure variations over the width of the tub so we can make our slices the whole width of the tub like this so this is this is a slicing strategy it's going to work for this problem spoiler alert um, but this slicing strategy is going to be useful for all kinds of problems that we're going to approach in fluid mechanics. So what's, so what's going on here? We have our wall and we can basically say there's a whole bunch of little there are a whole bunch of little forces each from pressure acting on one of these little strips. And we'll call each of these df um, in the sense that f would be some force. So df is the infinitesimal force acting on one of these infinitesimal areas. So df is an infinitesimal force. So df is basically going to be pressure times da, where da is the area of a slice. Right, so if you know in it's it sort of follows the same overall principle, force equals pressure times area, but in this case, because our area is infinitesimal, we get an infinitesimal amount of force that arises from it. And pressure, um, and you know, pressure is sort of acting on that whole area. So uh, so what's this going to look like? Well, we basically want to figure out what the overall force from all of this pressure is. So if we want an overall force from all of this pressure, all we need to do is integrate, i.e. add up all of these little dfs. So I'll, call, I'll say the force from the pressure is basically going to be equal to the integral of all of these dfs. And in, that, and in this case, it's going to be the integral of pressure times dA. And just to make sure we got our signs right, um, we're considering that this is really like an x force due to the pressure. And the pressure in this case would be pushing the wall, pushing this wall in the positive x direction. So we're OK there. So how does this, uh, how does this work out? So we have pressure, and we need to essentially integrate this pressure times the little dA's. We need to add up all of these for the whole overall slice. But before we do that, we're going to need to put pressure in terms of known variables. And we're going to need to um, manipulate dA a little bit in order to get it to a form where we can actually, uh, can actually crunch out this integral. All right, so what is dA? 
in this case. Well, DA is what is what we're calling the area of one of these little slices. And if we think about it, these are basically rectangles. So the area of a rectangle is just its width times its height. So the height of one of these individual slices is DZ, the width is W. So DA, in this case, is basically um, DZ times W. So we can replace DZ with W or we can replace DA with W times DZ. That's great. Okay, now we have a DZ here. So we're gonna have, we're gonna anticipate integrating with respect to Z. And of course, we're gonna start at Z equals zero. And at the top of the wall, that's gonna be Z equals, Z equals H, right at the top of the wall. Z equals H. So in this case, we're gonna, we anticipate integrating from zero, 0 to h. So what's the last missing piece in this puzzle? Well, pressure, this is not a constant, right? w will be able to pull out of this integral, but we know that pressure is a function of z. Um, and we're integrating with respect to z, so we can't just leave this p on alone. We need to put this p in terms of z. So let's do that. So we got to put p in terms of z. Well, we know. Um, from hydrostatics that uh, we can relate pressure and depth. So let's sort of choose two points for our hydrostatics. We'll just we'll choose one point um, at the at the top right here and we'll choose some other point at just some arbitrary height z right here. So in this case you know, if we wanted to sort of treat this point here, we could basically say, hey, the, the pressure at some point right here minus the pressure at this point up here, which in this case is zero if we're dealing with, if we're treating everything in gauge pressures where atmospheric pressure is up here, is basically going to be equal to minus rho times g times the z position of of this point and we said we started z at the bottom here so this is going to be the the z position of this point here minus the z position of this point at the top here which is going to be z equals h And anytime I get uh, get a result like this, um, anytime I get my hydrostatics equations here, I like to do a sanity check that at the very top we should get zero pressure. So if I sub in z equals h here, then p then the whole right hand side is zero, so p should be zero. And at the very bottom I get rho g h um, at the bottom. So if I sub in z equals zero, then I get rho g well, there's a minus h here, but a minus sign out front, so the whole right side becomes rho g h, which is what I know the pressure should be sort of at the bottom of a pool here. So it checks out. So what does this mean? Now I have pressure as a function of some known constants and, um, and z that I can sub in to this equation here. So how's that going to work out for us? Well, the force... The force from pressure is now going to be some integral that, spoiler, uh, spoiler alert, we're going to be able to solve. Awesome possum. So 0 to h, and then we're going to have minus rho g z minus h. times w times dz. All right, so um, so is this an integral? Can we solve this integral? Um, I now leave that up to you as a pause and ponder. Go ahead and solve this integral. Dust off the high school calculus. All right, so hopefully you've paused and worked it out yourself, but let's work it out now together. Um, these guys are all constants that can 
that can be pulled out. So up front, we can get um, minus row g w. And then when we integrate z, we get 1 half z squared. When we integrate h, we get, uh, sorry, this should be, my h should be in blue. h, uh, when we integrate h with respect to z, we get h times z. And of course, this needs to be evaluated, be evaluated from 0 to h. And when you evaluate this integral, we get minus rho g w um, 1 half h squared minus h squared. And the, the, the zeros, you know, the, the minus 0 part, like that, that, that would just be 0. So we can just get rid of that whole part of the term. Um, and then you, and then what do we get for the result? We get rho g w h squared and a 1 half out front. And this is our force due to pressure, which if we go back to our, force, uh, our free body diagram, um, the force from pressure must be perfectly counteracted by whatever applied force we need to do. Um, and there shouldn't be any other forces in X. You know, we've assumed that the seal also broke at the bottom. So this, you know, the ground can't apply any forces to the wall, any X forces to the wall as well. So this must also, uh, from, our, from our free body diagram, we conclude that this also needs to be equal to our applied force. Awesome possum. So whenever we get a result like this, we need to do a couple of sanity checks. What might those sanity checks be? Well, one sanity check that that's an important one is to check units. Remember, you know who will be very upset if we don't check units. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure that the left-hand side, well, the left-hand side has units of newtons, which is equal to kilogram meter per second squared, and we need to make sure that this equals the units on the right-hand side. So rho, remember it's density, that's going to be kilograms per meter cubed. G has units of meters per second squared. W has units of meters. And H has units of, well, H squared would have units of meters squared. So let's do some tidying up. This meters and this meters squared can cancel with the meters cubed in the denominator. And then we notice we have kilogram meter per second squared, kilogram meter per second squared. So baby, you know who is quite happy. Whew. Success. The second sanity check is to make sure that if things go up or down, um, you know, things scale in the right way, right? And it makes sense that whatever force that I'm applying, you know, if I were in a stronger gravitational field, then that the gravity intensifies the pressure. So I'm going to need more force to hold things back. If I had a wider tub, I would need to hold things back as well. Or if I had a more dense fluid in the tub, right? If it were if it were mercury in the tub, you know, if we wanted to regularly take baths in mercury, for example, um, I would need to apply more force to hold the the wall of that tub of mercury back. Um, or if it were a deeper uh, a deeper tub. Then I, would, then I would also need to hold uh, more force to hold it back. Now, where does, what's, the, what's the nature of this 1 half? And why is it h squared, right? Why is h squared? H, why is h the one that's squared rather than anything else? So let's, let's uh, unpack this final equation just a little bit. And I'm going to group um, a couple of terms together. So here, I'm going to do 1 half times rho times g times h, and then I'm going to multiply that by w times h. And then things might make a little bit more sense. Well, what is this w times h? Well, w times h 
is essentially w times h is essentially the area of this whole wall. So w times h is the area of the whole wall. And then what is, well, rho gh, rho gh is the pressure at the very deepest point in the tub. And the pressure at the very top is 0. So 1 half rho gh is essentially the average pressure. So this is the wall area. And this is the average pressure. Because at the very top, it's 0. At the very bottom, it's rho gh. So 1 half rho gh is essentially the average pressure. So in a sense, this result makes sense. right? If I took the average pressure on the wall and multiplied it by the wall area, then that would give me whatever force I need to apply in order to perfectly balance that pressure, or the force associated from that pressure. So this makes sense. Success. Let's pat ourselves on the back. Now onward to the next part of the problem. So here we have our wall, our force applied. We haven't yet squared away what distance what distance L this force should be applied from the bottom in order to, uh, to keep this wall from rotating. And if we think about, um, you know, if we think about rotations, we're gonna, we're gonna need to think about summing moments. So now, uh, instead of each little bit of pressure applying some little force, we're going to need to think about each little bit of pressure applying a moment to make this wall want to tip over. And we're basically going to need to have this force times L apply just enough moment in order to perfectly balance those two moments, right? So all the pressure is going to want to make it tip, let's say, this way. You know, all the pressure is going to want to make it tip clockwise about the bottom. And this force times L is, we need to make that want to tip it counterclockwise, just the right amount. So we're going to need, so we've already squared away what force we're going to need. Now we just need to adjust the height of that force in order to get the moment from that force just right to balance all the moment from that pressure. So how's that going to happen? Well, we're going to need to apply a pretty similar strategy of slicing and all that stuff, only instead of integrating all of the little dfs to get some overall force, we're going to talk about all of the little dms, not dungeon masters, little moments that all of these little bits of force apply. So let's get ahead. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'm still going to have my wall. Right. I'm still going to slice the wall up. And I'm going to have dz right here. And I'm going to sum moments about, let's call the, the bottom O, our origin. right? I'm going to sum moments about O counterclockwise positive. And that's going to have to be equal to 0. And the summing moments, is, there's going to be some contribution from all of the pressure, all of the moments from all those little bits of pressure, and then some moment from F times L, right? And if we think about moments, moments is the force, uh, the perpendicular component of the force times the distance that that force is applied from. And for counterclockwise positive, um, our force applied times L is going to result in a positive moment. And then the all of the moments from pressure are basically going to, to counteract that, right? So um, I'm just going to do plus all the moments from pressure. And we anticipate these actually, you know, the, like these are going to be, like what, we'll, we'll deal with the signs in just a minute. Um, you know, these are all essentially going to result in clockwise rotation. So they're, so they're going to be, um, we're going to have a minus sign show up pretty soon. So. Uh, so how do we get about how do we go about doing this? Well, we have, we follow a very similar strategy, um, and in this case, we consider this overall pressure moment a bunch of little dm's, and in this case, the dm's is basically the dfs that we got earlier times whatever radius 
um, each of these little DFs has from the origin. So in this case, the DM is just equal to DF times another factor of Z, because if we think about each of these, the moments from each of these little pressure forces, acting on each of these little individual areas, each of them has a lever arm Z that is acting about it for, for its point of rotation. So dm is equal to df times Z. Um, and here's where I want to be careful with my signs. All of these forces are going to want to uh, going to want to rotate us clockwise. So I'm going to put a negative sign in here because um, this is basically because these pressure, these little bits of pressure force cause clockwise, would, ca would, would want to um, cause clockwise rotation. So that's why I'm putting a minus sign in there. Okay, so, what's, so how's this gonna work out? Um, so the, the total moment from all this pressure is going to be what we get if we integrate, i.e. add up all of these dms. And we can use the same df that we that we worked so hard to to evaluate last time, right? So df is just pressure times the da, right? So each little bit of force um, is the pressure times that area that that little bit of force is acting on. So we can deal with that. So now we have minus z times pressure times da. Um, and we already have an expression for pressure in da. So minus z. We can sub in our expression for pressure that we had earlier. So pressure is minus rho g z, z minus h. So this was our expression for pressure. And our dA is just W, right, the whole width, times, times dz. And our limits of integration should be the same, right? We're integrating from the very bottom of the wall, where z equals 0, to the very top of the wall, where z equals h. h, sorry, h is a known constant, so that should be in blue. So we're going to integrate from 0 to h from z equals 0 to z equals h. Hey, wait a second. Is this an integral that we can do? Yes. So I pose that to you now as a pose and ponder. Go ahead and complete this integral. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so these minus signs cancel out. And what do we get here? Um, we can factor out rho g and w. So we get rho g w. And I'm going to distribute this z here. So we get an integral of z squared minus z h. dz from 0 to h. And we can we can go ahead and do this integral. So we get rho g w. If we integrate z squared, then we should get one third z cubed. And if we integrate z h, then we should get one half z squared h. And then of course we want to evaluate this at the limits of integration from z equals 0 to z equals h. Upper limit of integration, we're going to sub h in for the z's. Lower integration, we sub in zeros. And of course, you know, we get 0 minus, we get minus 0 minus 0. So whatever, we don't really need to worry about too much about the lower, lower limit of integration there. So then we get rho g w um, 1 third h cubed minus 1 half h cubed. <laughs> 
and then that ends up being minus one sixth rho g w h cubed. Okay, this is the moment due to pressure, which then we can sub in right here. So let's go ahead and do that. So zero equals F, F applied times L plus moment due to pressure. So we can say zero is equal to F applied times L minus one sixth rho G W H cubed. We can sub in F applied is actually known, right? We, we got that answer earlier in our notes. So we can sub this in and hopefully we can get L entirely in terms of known constants. Wouldn't that make us feel good? I think that would. So we get one half rho G W H squared times L minus one sixth rho g w h cubed. Ooh, fortunately a bunch of this stuff actually can cancel out, right? We could factor out a row, or we could divide everything by row, get rid of these guys, divide everything by g, get rid of these guys, divide everything by w, get rid of these guys, divide everything by h squared, so h squared, and we get rid of the h cubed there. And then we could bring whatever's left to the, uh, we could then multiply everything by two. And what do we get? Well, when you solve it all out, you end up with L is equal to one third H. Should be pretty obvious that the units line up. And this makes sense. And this makes sense in some sense too, that if the, uh, L is equal to one third H is basically telling us that we need to apply our force a third of the way up the wall. If we apply it, you know, if we applied it halfway up the wall, then all of this pressure from the bottom would be too much from the top and we'd rotate it this way. Um, so if we apply it just a third of the way up, there's less, there's more pressure right here, but less area that it's applying over more, uh, less pressure up here, but more area and more moment arm that it's applying it over. So putting it a third of the way up just perfectly balances it. Hurrah, we've solved this problem. So there we have it. Awesome, so um, I hope you've taken away um, and reaffirmed some problem solving strategies in hydrostatics and fluid mechanics problems. Right? These, these ideas of pressure being force times area, the idea of if you have some non-uniform distribution of something, breaking it up and slicing it up and then adding them all up, whether they be moments or forces. Um, so I hope all, all of this was useful. Thank you very much for listening and good luck with your fluid mechanics studies.